Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, joining this panel this morning. If you are, got up early this morning and went uh, to hear General Hersey this morning, you got more information about the cyber COE and some uh, tr truly great questions about multi-domain operations, you know, how to get there and so forth, uh, the entire information environment. Someone left some questions up here, about 10 of them from a previous uh, session. So if you don't have any questions, I've got questions in my hand, and they might just work. So this morning, uh, Mr. Ron Pontius is going to moderate a distinguished uh, panel this morning to talk about where we're going, how we're going to get there, and uh, to share with you uh, their the thoughts of the panel, but the emphasis is on you, the attendee. Uh, they want to hear from you. So please be ready for your questions, and let's uh, get going with Ron. Welcome, sir. Well, good morning, everyone. And again, right up front, I really want to thank a really great event and, and again, recognize the support and, uh, you know, behind the scenes of Major General Hersey and the Cyber Center of Excellence, but also Mayor Davis, the city of Augusta, the greater uh, Savannah, central Savannah River area, and, of course, um, not only our government partners, but industry academia. Thank you, and uh, we're going to have a great conversation this morning about a critical topic of data, okay? And, and you've heard it all week. The, almost every, every one of the main speakers, General Funk, General Fogarty, General Hersey, and others, is it's all about and fundamentally about data. And we've got a really great panel today pulled together to have this conversation. So quick introduction of the panel moving from my right is Major General uh, Retired Jerry Brome. Um, retired Signal Corps General and is uh, currently has his own Brome Consulting Company. But Jerry does a lot in this space, really thinking about what it really means about how to use data and improve how we do, do business in the Army and the government. On down next is Mr. Cameron Cherry. He's the Chief Technology Officer and Vice President for Pre-Sales Engineering at Dale Federal Systems. Next is Major General Tom Pugh, the Commanding General of 7th Signal Command here at Fort Gordon, and as part of our larger Army Cyber Command team. And finally, Colonel Carl Young of the Army National Guard. Uh, he's the, the Chief of the Army National Guard Affairs and Senior Guard Advisor to General Hersey at the Cyber Center of Excellence. So we've got a great panel, great diversity. We've got some upfront comments, um, and... We're planning on taking about 30, 35 minutes for those upfront comments, which leaves a great part of the, the session for you to ask questions. I will lead it off with some questions uh, while, you're, while you're warming up, but uh, let's have a great dialogue and a conversation on this critical topic. As I said, I want to start this conver conversation thinking about why data is both central to transforming the Army, the information age, and a critical element of achieving multi-domain operations and some of the challenges we face delivering timely and effective access to reliable data. As many of you heard General Milley, Army senior leaders, remark, technology has fundamentally changed the character of war. It's intensified geopolitical challenges, and it has transformed the strategic environment. Today, the greatest threat to our national security is strategic competence states. This includes nations and other adversaries including information warfare, beneath the level of armed conflict to undermine the interest of the U.S. and its allies and undercut our competitive advantage across every domain. Because of the, today's complex strategic environment, the Army developed the multi-domain operations concept, established the Army Futures Command to lead the modernization of the Army, and is implementing new talent management strategies to recognize what it really means to be in the information age. We know to compete, deter, and win against peer and near-peer adversaries having timely access to reliable and relevant data that can be shared and used whenever and wherever needed. Ensuring access to our networks and the reliability of our data and information are paramount to achieving multi-domain operations. Data is at the center of decision-making. 
In fact, there is a growing concept of data-driven decision-making. Combined with a reliable, secure, and resilient network infrastructure and aided by artificial intelligence and machine learning, timely access to trusted data will shorten the commander's decision cycle, enabling better decision-making. In a very real sense, in multi-domain operation, the network is another weapon in the commander's arsenal, and data is the ammunition. However, data is only useful if it is accessed, managed, and shared appropriately. Today, the Army is unable to exploit the full value of its information and data resources to identify opportunities and solutions, whether that's in the enterprise or in the tactical environment. The vast amount of data the Army generates is not methodically processed or stored, making it less, less accessible, less efficient, less secure, and less available for leveraging for decision-making and operations. We lack the systems, processes, and technologies to make accessing, synthesizing, and using data simple and effective. To be effective, data must be available on demand quickly and automatically. Effective data management requires a reliable and secure data infrastructure and data storage, allowing greater availability, control, and security. Lastly, data management must be able to evolve and improve with technology without loss of service to users. In order to reap the benefits of data management, the right infrastructure must be in place. Currently, our data is tightly coupled to specific weapon systems or stored in disparate infrastructure, making it difficult to query data across systems, wasting time, and reducing the quality of decisions. The lack of standardized data platform makes it difficult to share data across different infrastructure solutions. It creates an environment where analytics and applications are built to varying standards and can't be easily synthesized and integrated in a data-centric environment. The absence of one development standard for analytics and applications results in an environment that allows vendors to sell licenses for the same analytics and applications to multiple entities. In the future, data must be systematically available from many platforms and sources so it is stored securely and easily accessible when and where it is needed. Standardized data analytics will help simplify data sharing, making data more visible, accessible, secure, and interoperable. Automation can aid in data availability and access through rules and processes that routinely store data and determines the disposition of the data once a specified retention period has passed. Access of data to decision makers and other users will depend on having a unified network, enterprise to tactical, that is secure, reliable, resilient, and adaptable, and that can operate in a contested information environment. A unified network will also help break down data silos, enabling interoperability, and deliver data at the speed of need. The Army Futures Command is leading the Army's network modernization efforts focus on creating an integrated tactical network for battlefield communications and data sharing, and an integrated enterprise network providing cloud, business, and infrastructure services and applications. Data management and security is central to transforming the Army for, for the information age and achieving the tenets of multi-domain operations. Through network modernization and better data management, the Army will ensure our commanders, units, and our mission partners have timely access to trusted data. Defending our networks, systems, and data will be critical to ensuring both access to and the reliability of the data and ultimately the information. In the future, competition between nation states and other adversaries may be more about data and information than about ter territory or ideology, making data management and defense vital to successful multi-domain operations. Therefore, data must be treated as a strategic <laughs> asset. Carl Young, over to you. Hey, good morning, everybody. So uh, my name is Carl Young, and one of the reasons I'm here is my previous position was with the Headquarters Department of the Army, CIO G6, and we were struggling with how to frame this data problem, how to develop a data strategy that encompasses everything Mr. Pontius talked about and get it down relevant to changing the environment for the commander on the field. And that's what I'd like to focus on this morning. General Funk spoke specifically about 
our view of data is too narrow. We've got to broaden it. We've got to look at, excuse me, our view of information is too narrow. And, and we've got to broaden it and reach out and, and figure out how it's going to impact the decisions we make, what kind of decisions we make, and certainly the veracity and speed of those informations. General Fogarty talked about the fact that we have to see, or we have to sense, understand, decide, and act faster, that speed of need. And so that's great, and unfortunately it gets a lot of us focused on the technology capabilities. We can't forget the human in that loop. Just because I get that human with access to the data that they see and need doesn't mean they're going to make better decisions. We have to keep in mind the fundamental principles of how we make decisions in the military. Our leadership principles and our command principles have not changed. And Mr. Garcia focused on three areas of of influence that are kind of driving or maybe even restricting how we develop. And that be the cloud, what are we doing with it, how we leverage it, data, and then culture. So keeping in mind that we are fundamentally in a human business, keeping that at the absolute forefront of what we do, what we want to do is make better decisions faster. When we tie mission command to the multi-domain operations, what I would suggest we do is that we see, share, and act on reliable and trustworthy information. Now, I'm, I'm making a distinction between data, information, and later a little discussion on knowledge and wisdom. So if you've ever seen that pyramid that describes data as the foundation, wisdom is the pinnacle, we need to move our leadership into making reliable, good, data-driven decisions and wisdom at some point where I can use my experience to guide how I'm doing it. I'm not using my experience to guess whether or not enemies on the other side of the hill. Okay. So, and another consideration to, to make is we are in fact operating in congested and contested over in the information space. I would suggest we need to operate or consider operating, considering that we operate in a compromised domain. If we operate, if we assume from the get-go as a foundational view that we are operating in a compromised domain, we are going to treat our information differently. We're going to treat it like a strategic asset. If, if, if normally we're looking at our strategic assets like nuclear weapons, for example, we take those things very, very seriously. We have safeguards miles long. Burden the process, but we've got to take very care, very careful care with our data and our information in that strategic setting. The enemy, the adversary, could be with us today right beside. So we capitalize on what I believe it was uh, General Fogarty or General Funk uh, who made the comment. We capitalize on our asymmetric advantage that U.S. soldiers, U.S. leaders can make better, stronger, more independent decisions faster. And that is our true asymmetric advantage. It also gives us an opportunity to really link in, again, the use of military deception, information operations, uh, as well as our operational security. And over to General Brougham. Okay, good morning. My name is Brougham, and I'm the, uh, I guess, the epitome of a gray-haired, gray-bearded uh, consul here because I've uh, retired a uh, soldier, worked in industry. Now I'm free to offer observation and opinion sort of at will without trying to get too far over my skis while I'm doing that. Um, I'm, I read, started to read, tried to understand a book called uh, The Master Algorithm by Pedro Domingos uh, in preparation for this. And he posits the, the possibility that there's a master algorithm out there that once we find it, we'll be able to answer any question given enough data. And he gives some examples, right? Uh, but what I really took away from that first part of the preface, which is all I've gotten through, is that there are approximately, he estimates, two and a half exabytes of new data created every single day. Um, and he, he says that uh, traditionally we've, been, we've had three sources of uh, knowledge, evolution, uh, experience, and culture. And only in the last 35, 40 years have we gotten another source, which obviously is the computer, which can discover knowledge orders of magnitude faster and disseminate that knowledge orders of magnitude faster than any human being. So managing uh, an ever-increasing volume of data is, is really uh, a universal problem. And today we're going to be dealing with just a piece of that. So Greg Garcia yesterday 
said that he preferred to use the term opportunities rather than challenges. And I'm a generally positive guy, so I, I buy that. And I would just say that if that's true, we are in a target environment right now. Um, and I think I'm going to still talk about challenges because that's the way I see it. One of the, the most uh, critical aspects of data in a, terms of uh, military operations is speed. And Rob, uh, General Fogarty mentioned it, uh, foot stomped it in his presentation yesterday. And I would say 80% of the presentations that, that mention data also mention speed. It's a real concern. Speed on the next battlefield is a weapon. And the, the force that is able to use that more effectively wins. It's, I mean, it's as simple as that. Uh, Todd Isaacson yesterday was talking about MDO, and he made it clear that MDO is uh, still a concept, not a doctrine. But he did sort of express in his view what MDO entails. And when you think about what he said, which was, it's the ability to use information from any sensor, any platform, any network, any service, any weapon system, any time. The only way you're going to be able to address that kind of a challenge is mastery of data. We've got to get our arms around it. And beyond that, if that weren't bad enough, beyond that, there's still, when you look at it from a context of information warfare, then you're talking about adding in electronic warfare, social media, information operations on top of what we're already dealing with. Um, and I would say that the question then is, how do we get our forces in a position to acquire, store, verify, and validate, disseminate, analyze, and key here, action data in a timely fashion? And I think the problem is so big sometimes that we could almost get into a state of paralysis. You know, we, we wind up, you go blank stare, and you, you start looking for the grail or the master algorithm. Um, and I know from my, well, I believe from my experience there is no silver bullet. You just have to get after it. So in those terms, I've seen pieces of the solution, I believe. And uh, I just want to take a, a couple of minutes to to walk through that, to sort of lay out a process that I've seen being executed, and that the risk of being accused of sucking up to the panel moderator, which I, am, uh, I have no problem doing, uh, I want to use uh, our cyber as, uh, as an example of, of what's been done so far. In 2012, U.S. Cyber Command uh, went to CIO, uh, DOD CIO, and asked that they task DISA to, to, to take on an effort to uh, assemble data and look for ways to devise capabilities that would permit the start of uh, cyber situational awareness. And I won't bore you with the details, and I'd probably screw them up if I tried, but the net result of that uh, was the big data platform, or BDP. So, and I want to point out at the beginning that the way this was developed through DISA, BDP is a government-owned um, vendor and data source agnostic system capability um, with no licensing requirements for any of its software. So start with that premise, which ties back into some of the comments that Rod made earlier up. Um, so when that, that uh, was then adopted by Army Cyber very aggressively, they were the first ones in I can see to take that capability and really run with it. And they have their own instantiation of the big data platform, and there are many instantiations of the capability around, but theirs is Gabriel Nimbus. Uh, and in looking at the way they tackled it, I thought there are, there are four or five really key lessons that can come out of that, that from an approach point of view, not from the solution point of view, but how we attack the problem point of view, uh, that I'd like to go through with you. Uh, and the first was uh, culture change. Now, there's been a lot of talk about culture change. Again, uh, General Fogarty foot stomped that one again uh, yesterday as well. A lot of aspects to the here is 
culture change in terms of moving to fact-based decision-making, not rule-based, experience-based, or emotional-based decision-making, but fact-based decision-making. And what I saw coming out of that was the breaking down of silos, first within our cyber and then external to our cyber, where when you start looking at the facts, you can, you can convince data owners that it's in their best interest to share that data. And more than that, it's essential to combat effectiveness to share that data. Um, they also, that allowed them to, to look at the risk, reward, uh, benefits of cloud, use of commercial cloud. And they were an early adopter of the commercial cloud, which, again, from my 30 of what was going on, my impression is that they, they moved the needle or the timeline forward by about 12 to 18 months by doing that. Um, so the next thing was consistency of vision. And if you look at from the very first our cyber commander all the way to the current, Steve Fogarty, uh, there has been a consistency of uh, vision and a consistency of approach that if we're going to make if we're going to uh, advance in this arena, we're going to desperately need. The focus was to improve, not to abandon. Uh, they weren't interested in the next shiny object. They were interested in fielding operationally relevant capability as soon as possible. And that, that focus carries on to today, and it's what's making them move. I think a lot, I would say that the Army is uh, in many areas ahead in this arena of the other services, and I think it's because of, of that, one, that factor. Um, the next one is cost that I want to hit briefly. So embracing open source software, uh, firm fixed price contracts, which puts the, 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 takes the burden off of the government, the risk off the government somewhat, and the use of OTAs. And we can talk about OTAs. I think that is an, that's, a, that's another vehicle that they've been using very aggressively and to great effectiveness. Um, continual user involvement. Uh, agile uh, DevSecOps environment with their fielded units being able to look at what was being produced, play with it, offer comment back, and, and improve it, continually improve it, and in, in relatively short periods of time. Uh, and the very last one is fostering true uh, partnerships with industry, which I think they've done to great effect. And that means that uh, industry has been making small, maybe, but meaningful IR&D contributions to the overall F environment that has enabled them to field, uh, in some cases, I would call them leap ahead capabilities. So I think I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to... Over to Cameron Cherry. All right. First of all, Mr. Pontius, thank you for this opportunity this morning. I want to pull the thread on some of the opening remarks that Mr. Pontius and Colonel Pugh made, which I think are very important. When you have the privilege to work with former warfighters like uh, Colonel G or G General Custer, General, sorry about that, um, you learn something very quick. Really, it's all about timely and relevant because those are the only two attributes that really matter when we look at the processing of data into really information and knowledge. We also have to look at the operational environment because that's the other aspect of it. And when we look at it, we have to look at it from the foxhole back. So when you think about the next generation of digital transformation or the information assets or information enterprise, it's got to be about the edge first, your core, which is typically what we're seeing emerge with comms that you see, either in contested, congested, or disadvantaged environments, and then ultimately back to data processing centers, most of which are cloud-enabled today. So when we think of that information life cycle, it really has to start with the edge. And when we think about the edge and we look at some of the attributes that Mr. Pani has put out with agility, resiliency, and all of these other aspects that are vitally important for war fighting, it's all about software. We heard this from, from Major General Jerry Brom as well. It's got to be software defined. It's got to be software enabled because this is what allows us to instrument infrastructure to move with agility. 
Because let's face it, the mission isn't standing still. Mission requirements aren't standing still, so neither should your infrastructure. And one of the cultural changes we see rather rapidly in proudly supporting AFC is the ability to be agile. So it's no longer about building brick and mortar uh, information assets. It's about portable and tactical. Portable tactical clouds in places where you've never been able to deploy them before. In the back of Abrams M1 tanks, in the back of Humvees, strapped to soldiers without putting another 10 pounds in the rucksack so that I can actually look at troop strength. The other thing which I think uh, our point of view offers but challenges conventional thinking a bit is uh, the era of collecting data is going to die. You're not going to be able to collect enough data to feed your informational needs. And as Jerry Brome said earlier, the, the exabyte a day, uh, this is going to be incredible because we, we sell storage, as most people know. Uh, and working with NSA, I was talking to some of the colleagues out there, and they said, Cameron, we're about to write and And I snickered because I said a Yottabyte. I actually had to look up with that a Yottabyte actually exists, right? So we're talking about a completely new paradigm of how much data is being produced. I would offer you, and I'm going to take a complete guess, but I would offer you that by the end of today, just from the Fitbits, the cell phones, and everything going on in this room, this room will generate close to 250 gigs or 300 gigs of data by the end of today. Your health, how you're doing, you texted to your wife and your children, hopefully, and they know you're safe. All that data now becomes mission data, depending on the circumstance the mission scenario, the mission con op. So what we have to start leading into is changing the conventional thinking and culture. As General Braun mentioned, it's not about the collection. It's the algorithm. It's the analytics. And it's what is the data and information actually providing me? We have one other conundrum we have to contend with today. Uh, my daughter is your worst enemy. <laughs> Because now with 5G, she's going to be looking at stupid cat videos in high definition. So all of the 5G and network capacity that you're looking for from a warfighting perspective is going to be used by other sources, potentially adversaries. So we have to take a look at smart data management because it's going to be produced more at the edge and more in tactical than it ever will in your data centers. So uh, I'm excited for this conversation, and thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, General Pew, over to you. All right, thanks, sir. I, actually, we've been challenged to actually ask uh, different things of industry, so I'm going to start off with the very first one, which is uh, we really need industry to find a, a uniform for us that doesn't shrink every time that we wear it. <laughs> and so, so that's the challenge, number one. Hopefully we'll get a, a PEO out there to, to kind of help us out with that. I actually am going to talk about data from a convergence perspective, and I want to go back to several years ago with General Fogarty's first whiteboard session that he did for us in the big room uh, during TechNet. And he talked about kind of the, the big idea of the command post and going from the, the situation that we have today uh, through convergence uh, to eventually get to, to collaboration. And for those of you that were there, one of the key points of that was this thing called transport convergence. And along the, you know, the right side of his chart, it lists all of the, the transport systems that we had from the medical community to the, the logistics community through the intelligence community and then the command and control platforms themselves that actually pumped all that data. And then all, in order to get down to, through convergence to collaboration, we really needed to get down to, to one service provider, which was the, the signal core. And that is, continues to, to, to be worked today. And sitting over to the, to the actual, to the left side of this chart, was the data store. A day where every system that operates within the command post had its own data store, which is where we were today, a FATAD's data separate data. And the, the convergence there was the you know, unified data platform and uh, you know, now with where we are with the command post computing environment to get to the single data store so that, and this was sacrilege four years ago, but my AFATAD's data is actually in there intermingling with my DSIG's data, but all consolidated to the single data store. There was a problem with this chart, and the problem with this chart lines that went into the data store, and one said Nipper, one said Sipper, and one said JWix, and so we had we didn't have one data store, we had three, and if you add in our, our coalition partners in multi-partner environments, that command post now has four, 
because it has MPE and a fourth data store. I came from an organization, U.S. European Command, and ran 22 networks. 22 networks in U.S. European Command with 22 different data stores. And I would imagine that in, in CENTCOM with General Kilgo at the time, he had 22 different data networks and 20 different tours. And just doing some math in public, that's 2 times 22. All different data stores. And then we ask ourselves, well, let's go do some big data analytics. And, and what you really have is you really can't do big data analytics on a bunch of little bitty data stores. And so we're, we're at the point now where convergence has got to go into the data store itself. And we've got to look at multi-layered security within the actual data store. And so now, and it's not the AFATAD's data and the DSIG's data fraternizing together. It's my, my unclassified data, my secret data, and my top secret data all fraternizing together within the same data store so that we can actually have and execute big data analytics on the data store itself. We only have to store the grid coordinates once instead of 22 times 22 times 22 different times, which is where we are right now. And so we really have got to, to, to get to that point. And at that particular point, and I'm a networking guy, what, what actually occurs with the single data store is there is no Nippernet. There is no Cipernet and there is no JWIX. There is no MPE times however different many times you stand up a multinational coalition to, to fight. And that's how we're actually going to enable ourselves to take advantage of the limited bandwidth that we actually have available. As, as we described, as our, as our kids take up all the bandwidth, we really have got to do things more effectively. Right now, our only means of getting big data analytics is we either scan into the network to, to locate in all the different classifications levels, or we transmit the data back to a single point where it can be consolidated at the, at the TS level. And in the world of tactical communications, in the world of MDO, and the limited bandwidth we will have when we fight on the battlefield, we will not have any big data analytics if we can't get to, to a single data store. And so I do have, I think there's really four things that I would ask from the entire community here to kind of help us get there. Uh, first, from an Army perspective, data management has got to become co-equal, if not above, information dissemination management, content staging, uh, cybersecurity, and network and enterprise services management. Those three key elements, data management has got to be equal within the Army. Within the Department of Defense, we've got to look at our policies that are actually, we have Nipper and Sipper because of policy, not because technologically we need it. And so we've got to look at the policies and what can we do to actually change the policies to en enable multi-level security. And we've got to explore, you know, from a, a PEO and an academia or, or industry and academia perspective, you know, how can we get after multi-level security in a way that we can actually afford? Key to that, as you can imagine, is identity management, not just for the individual user, but for the systems that we have that we need to run on those networks continuously. So our identity management has got to have multi-levels of security in it. It's got to be able to determine who you are, do you have a need to know, and do you have the classification level to access uh, the data that you're actually trying to, to get to. And then fourth, from the entire community, and specifically academia, today the United States, and I've kind of just from a network perspective, we could open up our CIPRNET to the entire multinational community, and no one would join. Because they, other countries also have their, their individual policies that, that are limiting within the world of data. And so from an academic perspective, we need to find out what those limitations are, not just of other individual countries, but of treaty organizations. What is the, the European Union data policy? And from a legal and an operational perspective, that, if you actually read it, is an extremely limiting it limits our ability to maneuver their data across our networks. And, but we, we've got to academically actually look at this and determine what, what is the best way for us to be able to achieve the single data store in the multi-partner, multi multinational environment. And, sir, I'll, I'll close there, and, and I think we're all going to look forward to your, your great, great questions, of which I'm sure I won't be able to answer any of them, <laughs> which you'll...
That's so, all I've so, clear, so clearly, um, if you weren't excited about data before you joined this morning, you, you absolutely know the – hopefully we've conveyed the imperative. It is absolutely essential to moving to an information age, right? So I'm going to start off with a couple questions, and as, uh, as you guys are warming up, and then, like I said, we've left a lot of time to really come at – um, to have a dialogue here this morning. So let me start, um, and again, I'm, I'm going to direct towards one person, but others can, can also uh, join in if you've got something to add to it. Carl, why is it imperative for DOD to have data standards and establish interoperability goals as we move forward? So standards have to be the cornerstone and foundation of what we're doing. Uh, we have to know how we're collecting data in a chaotic environment, because we're producing chaotic data all the time. Uh, whether it's your, your personal notes, your, your email, uh, your PowerPoints, uh, your grocery list, et cetera. All of that can provide guidance and insight. So without those standards, however, either the standards in collection, the standards in retention, or the standards of content management, we have no way to feed it into the great gonculator in the sky. We have no way to begin to assess how we move that data from its chaotic environment to a more ordered environment where machine learning can then aid us and uh, uh, an artificial intelligence can help improve that data. Can't be done. Now, some of the things we are trying to do is, is build those standards in such that we, we, it's dependent upon uh, automated tagging. Um, for anyone who has ever worked on the joint staff, there used to be a, a program we'd have to use in, in theory Every PowerPoint we would make, I'd have to spend, you know, however many hours that I didn't have cramming for a, a, a five-minute PowerPoint presentation, and I'd spend an extra 20 minutes tagging the thing. You can imagine how well that actually worked with the humans involved. I never tagged anything. And so we have to help get machines to help us with that tagging, to, to realize the vision that uh, General Pugh talked about where there isn't a sipper, nipper, j other. They're simply transport. Tagging is critical to make sure that which needs to be safe is safe because that's the foundation for it. Okay. Uh, Cameron. Sir. How do you see industry either currently helping or can help in the future for creating, promoting, sustainment of data standards? That's a great question. Uh, for industry, we're really pushing not just the, the standards themselves, but then how information management works on top of the standards. Uh, we work with a lot of standards bodies like IEEE, ISO, and some of the others to try and help define more common standards so that as industry we become more open core rather than closed systems, as uh, General Brom talked about. You know, we can't hold your data hostage, right? It's got to be portable. It's got to be able to move across your systems as you modernize uh, your infrastructure. I've worked a lot of the standards bodies out there. We uh, are interoperable when you look at that from an industry perspective with all the standards bodies. But I would also offer you, it's got to be built into your technology as well. And Colonel Young really started to pull this thread. Rather than us relying on the human, which we know is always the weakest link in the, the chain here, not in a derogatory manner, we, as you mentioned, we have you know 30 hours of work to do in a 24-hour day. Uh, we have to be able to build that governance and those standards into software and into how the hardware actually ingests the information. So a lot of the AI initiatives we're seeing and we're working on today are how do we actually auto metadata tag information and then how do we enforce the standards at the software level so that it removes that burden from the human at the time of uh, either data creation or data collection. Okay. Uh, General Pugh, building on your earlier comments, what are the biggest data management issues the Army is facing? Sir, I, I think it is our ability to actually be able to get the, the big data store. You know, I'm a, a, a large group of, of what we call data scientists that have been studying this problem for many, many years, and they've, they've come to one conclusion, and that conclusion is very simple. we got a lot of data, which, which kind of gets back into the, the – uh, but, but it's our ability to actually be able to utilize the data, to, you know, through some of these automated tools to actually make it useful for us. You know, because because right now, because of all the little data stores, as I kind of mentioned, we, we are not operating at, at speed of need. It, it is, you know, data moving through cross-domain solutions that limit its, its throughput. 
be able to, to, to be consolidated so that we can actually analyze it. And by the time we analyze it, we're at a different grid coordinate because of, of maneuver. And so I, I think that's, you know, those are some of the, the challenges that we do have. But policy and culture, you know, policy and culture are, are two of the biggest. From a transport convergence perspective, our biggest limiting factor there is culture. From a network convergence perspective, as I described, it's actually policy. And so we really have got to identify which ones we, we've self-limited in the, in the world of policy. So we really have got to figure out which one of those we can, we can overcome. Okay. General Brown, how would you assess, again, your 30,000 foot of you have the, a, a great perspective of you know, being in government, being in industry, and now kind of working between the two and kind of uh, lending your advice, as you said. Um, how would you assess the level of coordination or cooperation among the various defense organizations in dealing with the data challenge? Um, I guess I, I'd say it's a work in progress. Um, there's there's a lot that can there's a lot more that can be done than it's being done right now. But I do see uh, some uh, real signs of hope for 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 getting after this. Tom mentioned uh, culture. I, I think that's that's the number one thing that I see moving across the DoD leadership. There is, uh, from my perspective, a recognition that the culture just has to change. And like I said before, a piece of that is in terms of getting to organizations that make decisions based on fact. It's it's and it. It sounds easy, but it's hard. Um, we all have our own sets of experiences growing up, right? And we all view the through those experiential uh, events that we've had. And that's not always, in fact, it's never probably the best way to make a decision. So I've heard uh, everybody from uh, Mr. D.C., and uh, Co Michael Conlon, all the way down to the chief of staff of the Army, and, and all the way down the, the chain, people who are recognizing that that's, uh, that's an issue. Um, the other thing is, I think that um, getting the, the attitude to just get after it is something that I see that's really encouraging across the department. Um, it's not a question of uh, let's study this to death and, and worry ourselves into a fit of uh, inaction just because the, the problem seems so great. They're picking individual pieces of that problem and attacking it and moving forward. And it's not perfect. There are mistakes. Uh, but the process in, in general is on the right path, and that's being pushed at a, whole, uh, a, a number of, of levels. Um, and this is a little bit off the topic probably, Ron, but the other thing that I wanted to mention in this regard is I've, I'm really encouraged by the um, changes in philosophy relative to contracting across the DOD. Um, it may seem like a small thing, but it, it really is a pretty big thing when you're looking at how to accelerate the acquisition process and how to uh, develop prototypes quickly and, and get them out of the field and play with them, test them, revise them, throw them out maybe, uh, and, then, and then move on. One of the big things uh, with, I mentioned OTAs before, but one of the big things that is not often recognized in the use of that vehicle itself, I mean, it is designed for prototyping, but it puts the, the user, the requirer, in the driver's seat in terms of the contract. Though that organization, that person who has the requirement is the decision maker. So all of that to together really, I think, is moving us in the right direction. Okay. Open it up. Got some questions? Okay, there's one in the back. Hey, I just want to say thanks for taking the time. This is a good panel. Uh, the question is cryptography and security. You're doing standards. What is the priority of really understanding uh, that bit of data as you're working your priorities? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant question. I can tell you our point of view from, from industry's perspective is cryptography is the underpinning for anything with regards to the next generation of data. We're looking at uh, a lot of things with regards to blockchain and some other uh, algorithms that we can also contend with in concert with the data. Because what we're beginning to fastly realize with our experiences working with Tesla or other companies that want to take an algorithm and push it to the edge, you not only have to protect the data transmission, but the algorithm and against bias, right? What we see coming is not so much kinetic fighting, but it's going to be a war of algorithms, right? The speed of decision is one thing, but then to being able to make sure you made the right decision of what the algorithm returned back to you is critical, right? Because you, then you don't want the adversary in the loop, typical man in the middle. So encryption everywhere, data in motion, data in rest, and then actually looking for ways to encrypt at the capsule level from a transport, layer two, layer three, so that we can guarantee sovereignty of the actual information itself. As an example, with Tesla today, they want to be able to push uh, updates down to the vehicle, but also receive the analytics off the vehicle between seven and 10 times in a 24 hour period. Right. So in order to do that, as you can imagine, we have to push new algorithms to the vehicle. The vehicle's got to receive them sometimes while people are driving them and driving them in disadvantaged comm zones because we know we don't have a lot of coverage in certain areas. And encryption is the heart of all of that. So it absolutely is the baseline for anything that we look at. Next question. <clears throat> so the whole idea of using blockchain and that kind of infrastructure to uh, protect and to authenticate the source and the origination of data really sort of boils down to how do we protect the credentials? So what are you seeing in the world of not just encryption, but how, we're, how, we, how can we become much more effective in protecting, protecting key exchange and credential uh, utilization? You want to jump, Tom? So I don't think he was asking me that, 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 that but, but I'll, I'm just going to tell you that, that our credentialing right now doesn't even work the, the way that it, it needs to, at least within the, the Army's network. And we, we have significant challenges. And so I think the, the best way to answer that question is to divert it right back to every single one of the booths out here to, to kind of help us figure that out. Because it's going to be the key to our ability to be able to access the, you know, the, that cell encrypted data in the data store but in a way that ensures that it's the right identity actually going after it. I, I, at this point, though, I don't know what the answer would be. So I'll, I'll uh, see if y'all. I'll be happy to test your Pontius. Uh, today, credentialing is probably one of the more vital things that we look at. Uh, we use software-based tokens a lot for not only who is at, on the network, but what as well. So we can identify the device that the person's using and if it's trusted uh, on the network. Uh, and I think credentialing is only going to increase in importance as we move to these zero trust types of strategies. Um, be very transparent as industry. Zero trust is probably a little bit of a pipe dream today, right? Start with software to define. I, I love, General Brahm, I love what you say here. It's like you got to get after it. So a great exemplar is getting after it is just software to find your networks at this point. Take full advantage of micro segment isolate by application. I can shape the traffic. I can control the credentials on a much uh, smaller scale so that the problem set doesn't become so overwhelming. But it does become a combination of the credentialing and then software defining your network so that you can have that uh, need to know or COI type of access. Because once you software define everything, you have the ability to manage the tagging and the access at that level. There, there is one thing, though, that I, you know, back into, because all I'm doing is asking y'all you know, for a bunch of assistance here. But w whatever we come up with is that final or the, the interim solution, which will always be in that state. It has to be mobile. Not mobile from the way you kind of think about it, but mobile from a tank and an artillery perspective. It's got to be mobile on the actual battlefield and in a way that we can actually, uh, our identity can still be confirmed when we are disconnected. And, and so it's, it's really, really important that we, we have it built that way. Yeah, I'll add two thoughts. One is the, there's a recognition 
of, of identity, credential, and access management. And in fact, uh, the General Crawford is a CIO G6 of the Army is finalizing an ICAM strategy. And what's really important there is General Crawford, General Fogarty are really talking, strategies are interesting, but how are you really going to get after it? And so uh, really a partnership saying, so what's the, what's the action plan? What's the implement, implementation plan to get at uh, this ICAM strategy the Army should be issuing pretty soon? Uh, second comment is I think there's a, a, lot of this, a lot of thought now about uh, completely changing our approach to this and really go to a zero-trust environment. Um, industry is doing that in many ways, right? Um, not to name particular companies, but, uh, um, you know, that's the foundation of Uber, right? It's a zero-trust environment as, as an IT-based uh, organization, right? And that, that changes that dynamic about what you're doing with ICAM because uh, the way we've traditionally done it with all the trust relationships is by fundamentally that is a major risk. And so, and so I think that's an area, and I know industry's been doing a lot, he's been doing uh, a lot of research in this area, and I believe that's part of where we'll be getting at is what's the really way ahead about moving to a zero trust environment. And that, that also builds on what General Pugh was talking about earlier, right? His comments earlier is really foundational to that is zero trust. Next, com next question. Sir. Thank you all for your time. This has been a great panel. I have a just kind of question that crosses just about everybody's comments. Uh, traditionally, when standards and interoperabilities and policies have been set, that tends to stifle innovation in industry. Um, that's a challenge I see across this. Data is a little bit different than hardware and software. How do you address the challenge of getting the policy and standards right to keep industry moving forward and competition and all those good things that happen with uh, to create new stuff to get at this issue. Thank you. So I'll take the first crack at that. Okay. Um, one of the things we've got to do is as we approach these standards is, is fundamentally look at it as setting the conditions for collaboration and interoperability, accepting chaos as a condition of that standard, and encouraging, as a matter of fact. So instead of, uh, you know, the, the World Wide Web Consortium and its associated standards gave us the Internet, and now we have a, a very flexible information medium. We're discovering other challenges, but that's okay. And at the end of the day, what we have to do is, is look at it from a point of view where the standard presents my interoperability opportunities. And, and if I choose not to adhere to that standard, I limit those engagement chances, you know, the chances where you and I can share data. Yeah, maybe just to dovetail a little bit off of that, what we're finding now emerging uh, from learnings working in the, the AI space um, it's a little bit more of a balance between standards and common vernacular, mm -hmm. right? So when we think about um, identifying, let's say, visually a tank, right, there's attributes that you can call that say it's a tank. It's got a, you know, tracks on it. It looks like this. It has this shape. It's got armor, et cetera. Common vernacular of certain things in the enterprise rather than the standard so that you have the flexibility. So at least everyone's speaking on, a, on the same sheet of music. We're finding a lot of that with AI as you get the inference models and the learnings. It's not so much about setting a data standard that's rigid. It's setting a data standard that's mapping to the mission need and the mission requirement the way the mission speaks. And then setting that common vernacular for the interoperability that Colonel Young was describing. Now, it's like the NATO model or country's native language in English. Now, what we're saying is, is when you know that object, you understand what that object is and what its digital footprint or digital resonance looks like. And I think it's really the combination of a balanced approach of those two. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add, first of all, Joe shouldn't be allowed to ask any questions here. Um, but from a, from a, this is like a blinding flash of the obvious, but there's a constant chicken and egg situation between industry and the government relative to standards, right? Uh, the government wants to have some assurance that there's going to be interoperability at some level as they're going through, so they're defining standards. The industry says, well, when you define those standards, now you've limited what I can really provide you, you know, and so this is, this is part of the learning process as I see it going forward, where a better dialogue between industry and government 
uh, in terms of co-op. So there's an understanding of what is really trying, what the government's really trying to achieve in this case, and what do they what do they need to have in place to achieve that, and government's input, uh, uh, industry's input on what what's really doable, and are you precluding things by the way that you're defining these standards, right? So it's it's a dialogue in this area is really really critical, and it has to occur in the environment of a of a true true partnership, where this is not gotcha on either side. We're really trying to get to the fielding of a capability. And and so let me jump in here as the moderator and build on that question and and the answer. And Cameron, how is the opportunity of cloud? helping when you think about data interoperability and particularly when you're thinking about, you know, movement to artificial intelligence, machine learning? Yeah, it's a, that's a brilliant question because it really is the underpinning of everything. When we define cloud, though, Mr. Pontius, it's, it, it is about defining it as an operating model, not as a destination. Um, most people, when they talk cloud today, you think of Amazon Web Services or you think of Azure, which are destination public addressable clouds. But your, your comments are uh, extremely insightful because when you think of cloud as an operating model, it now gives us a construct to deploy it into those tactical and those disadvantaged settings in very portable uh, manners and portable form factors. And cloud itself, when you look at the underpinning uh, technologies, it is built on a standards-based approach or a commercial off-the-shelf-based approach. So a lot of your standards development uh, from an interoperability perspective has been completed by that simple task. Uh, when you deploy it forward, it's still using the same interoperable standards, uh, still same security standards that you would secure JWIX or even SCI, SAPSAR environments. And uh, it's managing data and software in the same capacity in a forward state as it is in a commercial uh, joint cloud. But brilliant comment because it really is the underpinning of all of this as we look at uh, what we're really trying to do with AI or with uh, machine learning and getting the warfighter the information at the appropriate time. Okay. Next question. I'll take a stab at one. Uh, in that uh, diagram that General Fogarty uh, drew a few years ago that General Pugh uh, referred to, uh, he also had like a siphon of the tactical programs that would go down and it'd come out the bottom and, and there'd be intelligence. How in the world do we get to intelligence today with, this, uh, with all the data that's out there? How do we get there? How do we get to the decision-making process of intelligence? Go ahead, someone. All right, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you maybe an example, but uh, at the risk of being kicked out of an Army conference using an Air Force example, maybe. Hey, we believe in jointness, okay? Uh, we do believe in jointness, that is the truth. Well, the Army does have the biggest uh, Air Force out there, right, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let, let's take a look at, at something, maybe not just a true intelligence from the two mission, but the intelligence from a kinetic platform. Let's look at like the JSF, right, the, the Joint Strike Fighter, and how we're actually getting information off of that airframe as it flies. <clears throat> when you think of that airframe, it's got over 600 sensors that are all active in generating information during a flight. Uh, part of them with rapids and knowledge management is that when the pilot lands approximately 30 minutes after a sortie, we can actually pull all of the intelligence off the airframe itself and we can determine how it performed during combat. So when we talk about intelligence and then using information as a strategic asset, we're now informing the commander not only of how the, the warfighter performed, but the fighting platforms themselves. And then being able to make those real-time adjustments. But it really is underscored by what General Brown said. When you say get after it, these are clear examples where you're taking just slivers of the mission segment, you're adding some intelligence to it, you're adding a little bit of, of uh, analytics, artificial intelligence if you want to go that far, but you're getting intelligence off these platforms, right? And there's, there's hundreds of examples. Another Air Force, if you look at the AOCs, the way they did the tanker refueling applications, which now led to Kessel Run and some of the other uh, software development, what that informed us is the ability to find savings quickly by simply finding small, very simple aspects of the mission, even in operational environments with active theater, active threat. We can do it safely using secure DevOps. 
uh, and taking those to provide the analytics to the commander and then from there systematically moving on a modernization path. And the new intelligence we're getting from a digital perspective with the analytics and security built in is just extraordinary. So this is not an answer, <clears throat> but a comment, right? So it's for me, it's even more complicated because when you say intelligence, you, you need intelligence to, to do what? To make a, a tactical decision or a strategic decision. Intelligence is different depending on what level in the operation you're talking about, right? So right. It, it's not... It's and the AOR you're in, yeah, that's where right. you are in your geography, right? right. It matters. Right. right. So it's, <clears throat> it's even more complicated. Yeah, and I would just go into another Air Force example, you know, from Boyd. And, if, and so in, in kind of what we've described in, our, our, in a number of different terms, but it really is all about the OODA loop and our ability to observe, orient, decide, and act. And so it's about getting the right information at the right time. It's not about having everything simultaneously. Right. If we have everything simultaneously, you're not in an OODA loop. You're, you're kind of in an observe, orient, observe, orient, observe, orient. And you never get to the point where you can de decide and act at, you know, at the speed of, of war is, is, is what we're going to have to be able to do. And so we, we've, you know, that information part at the bottom where it said in, intelligence wasn't actually necessarily the intel community. It was about having the, the intelligence at the commander's level with the right information you know, at, at the right time. It's a part of that capability has got to be to be able to tailor to that individual commander what they need for making decisions. Right. That tailoring, you know, yep. maybe it's part of your tagging, maybe it's how you collect your data. They don't need everything, as General Pugh said. They'll get swamped by just information. But tailor the data, give them what they need relative to their environment and their style even. Then they can make their decisions faster and use their, their innate capabilities. General Brome, building on your earlier <laughs> comments where you talked about the challenges, what do you see as the toughest challenge to achieving the level of data integration that will enable multi-domain operations? Uh, you know, it's, it's, I may be missing something, but that's sort of a, a uh, for me, it's a twist or a little variation of the, of the issue before. I, those three things that I mentioned are still, in my view, um, you have, to, you have to solve those in order to get at uh, true uh, capability to do multi-domain operations. You know, part of this is, you could go back to speed, you, you can't do MDO uh, without speed, without data at speed. And in trying to enable that, you have to get through all of the other three things that are three or four things that really affect that. And, and uh, I'm sounding like a broken record here, I know, but culture is at the top of that list for me. And it's, it's very hard, actually. You know, it, it's easy to say culture change, right? When you get into an organization that is used to doing things in a certain way, all, every organization has a culture. And, and changing an organizational culture is very, very difficult stuff. And it, I think we have to recognize that it's, it takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. The secret here is that we have leadership in, in place that can keep after it, that will not tire, that will keep pushing it. You see it changing. At, I see it changing at the top. I don't see it changing at the bottom. And uh, it's just going to take time to get down there. Anybody want to add anything else to that? Yeah, you know, I'm highly, highly encouraged about Army Futures Command, uh, Mr. Pontius, because it, it it brings all of the things together that General Brougham's talking about. It's the change of culture, the capability, policy, contracting, because everyone is there focused on one single thing, and that's changing the mission, modernizing the mission, whether it's just a con op, whether it's technology, whatever the case is. But to, to see what's going on inside the Capitol factory in Austin and seeing everyone together almost aligned as a joint program team that says we're going to go solve for this problem with every aspect, not just technologically, but policy, how we contract for it, how we do it at scale, it really is incredible. And it's probably one of the most encouraging things I've seen in the last decade as industry. Okay. Uh, Cameron, uh, how do we ingest manage and analyze information that may, may be outside of our governance 
and management. So come at it first from an industry point of view, and then uh, uh, maybe General Pugh or Colonel Young can add it from a government point of view. Again, uh, that whole idea of, of data governance, uh, which is a quite an interesting topic, obviously related to standards, policy, culture, all those things. But what do you think? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we see the phenomenon rise a lot with OSINT, right, because we, we can't really control the data. We're ingesting it. So, uh, again, bringing learnings forward of what we're currently seeing with AI and that and this, I'll call it Wild West, or uh, Colonel Young called it chaotic data. That's the perfect term for it, is as you ingest it, you have to bring it into your governance it's out in the wild, right? So you have to then infer against it credibility of the data itself. So it comes back down to the teachings I, I always get from my two officers. Credibility your source. Size up your source. Put a credibility metric against it. But as you ingest the data, it is telling you something. Because uh, unfortunately, we are living in a world today where people are, are putting out data on the Internet uh, freely and openly. The question is, is are those people representing it properly without bias or without anything to get to a factually driven conversation? So um, there's always a balance between how we're ingesting it and how we're then bringing it into our governance and policy uh, as we treat things like OSINT, et cetera. Okay. And, you know, sir, I would just add, you know, not on the governance side of it, but but I think we, we, we've actually forgotten how to ask questions. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, f- from my perspective, uh, just in general, you know, I've search engine A, I, I've gotten lost in the Internet because I don't know how to ask the search engine the question. And, and so I just give up and, and, you know, go ask my staff to actually find it. <laughs> and but, but as we've gone through and we've done a lot of, of AI experiments, that's what we're, we're coming up with is we, we really do not know how to ask the, kind of the Intel, Intel community and the computer the, the right questions, and we're really struggling with it. And, and some of it gets into the terminology differences that we, we do have, but, it, but it's, it's a challenge, and, and it's really surprising. Our kids know how to do it. We don't. Unfortunately, right now, it's us that are trying to ask the AI capabilities those questions. Well, and I'm actually going to kind of maybe retrospect this a little bit because the, part of the culture change our kids know how to do it. My 13-year-old daughter, you know, to the equivalent of programming the VCR now, and I don't know how to do it any longer. Um, the, the kids know how to do it, but they do not understand it. And so I would argue that our commanders in the field are always going to face the fundamental aspects of conflict to include friction and chance. So when you're governing your data, if you, if you over-govern all of it, it becomes kind of sterile. That chaos harbors and brings forth with it chance as well. And I think we need to equip and enable the commander to make that assessment. Uh, Cameron made a comment about the credibility of the data. That is valuable, but it can't become a crutch, and that's a cultural thing. You know, as much as we're trying to get to the, the one ring to bind them all, the master algorithm, we have to then e- enable those human commanders to ask the questions of the data, understand kind of the feedback and where it comes from, and then use their estimation and their wisdom, not their guts, uh, operational decision. Governance comes back to a human at point of utilization. Roger. Okay. I'm actually impressed you have a VCR still. <laughs> Ronnie, I, I'm going to take, I'm going to ask permission to come back to that MDO operational okay. question. Because uh, there's w- one thing, I'm, I'm a little slower now. Um, there's one thing that I did want to mention, and I, and I failed to do that, and that is in terms of enabling MDO, that is the ability to access data. So, you know, when I talked about breaking down the silos, that has to happen at every level. If we want to be able to uh, be in a position to predict enemy action, we have to have the ability to see patterns. And you can't see patterns if you don't have access to large amounts of data You just and data from different sources. You know, we can have the best AI in the world, but if we're working on a very narrow set, we're not going to get what we need. And that still, in my view, is a large problem that that is permeating the government. It's changing in in some places, not changing in others, um, and uh, that's just something that we have to get after. Okay. So, so I'm going to. 
go back to what General Brome said, we an Army Cyber Command with our big data efforts, and tell you a little story about that, give you the opportunity to think about your final question before we wrap up. And so what we have done is, as, as, Jer- as Jerry said, really working with the community. We've got an agreement of what is basically a, a, um, an open source-based uh, platform that is the best of the tools in industry uh, there. With that, what we've worked through is we've really started at the bottom. We, we've created essentially, or we're, we're working on this, a sensor architecture because when you think about the network, we have lots and lots of sensors, right? Um, many of them technology-based and other times they're general officer sensors if, they're, if their email's out, right, Tom? Okay, he gets on the basis, right? But, but there's a variety of sensors. But the sensor architecture to then says, what's the data from all those sensors to then be the data architecture and how we're doing data ingest into our data lake and now have across our, the Army portion of the Doden in excess of 400 data sources that are coming into our big data platform to truly then be to able to act with analytics to be able to ask the interesting question from that enriched data. And, and then based upon that common uh, big data engine, we have, we have agreement of what is the analytic framework so government or industry can build the analytics that will work on in that environment, run on that engine, accessing all the enriched data in the data lake. And so then with the analytics and the visualization, then industry can really focus on helping us ask those really interesting questions, help us move to, I think, which is a real challenging area, situational awareness or situational understanding mean in the, in I'll say, the Doden part of the cyber domain. How do we really have awareness of what's happening in the environment, not only from an operate point of view, but from a defend point of view. And as General Fogarty talked about yesterday, that is our number one mission in Army Cyber Command. It's to operate and defend the Army portion of the Doden. That's what we spend the majority of our time on um, at, the, at the leadership level. And General Fogarty has absolutely powered and enabled uh, General Barrett as the commander of NETCOM to be doing that mission on behalf of the Army as the operational command for it. So I think we've really got some good things happening, but we also then run into the ops folks are quite used to doing things in a manual way and now have the power of the big data analytics to help them really automate many things. And so that's part of the culture we're doing in our ops centers, our cyber centers, and eventually we'll be able to have the capability being able to be accessed down at the network enterprise center, down at the NEC, where we're really providing the capability. Additionally, we're working on now building upon that and say how do we share um, a view of the battle space for our supported commands. And so we're working a pilot right now with Forces Command and Army Material Command, what we call a Cyber C2 dashboard, to let that that supported entity be able to see their space of what it means from the network and the domain. One of the challenges we had to work through, of course, we've, you know, we've constructed things all based on uh, IP addresses, but there was no IP to UIC, right? So we had there's on a base, but we couldn't say, well, that's in 2nd Brigade, 82nd Airborne Division, or that's at Army Material Man Headquarters. So we've been working hard about having a correlation with our big data and about how do you relate an IP to, to a unit. Well, one of the things we did, we've ingested property book data. Okay? Property book data has a computer, has to a unit. Right, and we so we're working variety of the data ingest about how do we relate it because what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to at uh, and and I see Bill Lasher in the audience and he 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 always said you know back then General General Abrams you know what's what's the situation across forces command of how we're doing you tell us to do these patching and you tell us we have these cybersecurity risk risk and, and and so help me do that so that's partly that's what we're working also it's not just about army cyber command but how do we enable commanders in the in the arm operate and defend their part of it as part of the overall team 
it's absolutely a big data problem. That's what we're driving hard on, and we're working at uh, we're the pilot. So last last call for questions. Other than that, we'll wrap up. Okay. General Pugh. All right, sir, thanks. I, I just want to kind of, just in closing, really kind of throw two things at you. One is something one of my guys, I'm going to paraphrase what one of my guys said yesterday, which I thought was pr pretty doggone enlightening. And, and essentially what he said is, is the only thing faster than speed of light is data at rest, <laughs> right? And, and so w w we, we do have to figure out how to, how to transmit the, the right data at the right time, especially on the, the tactical battlefield. And then I'd like to raise up just, you know, at, out of the data store just a little bit, to, to talk very, very briefly about the standards and, and governance uh, dis discussion, which actually came from multiple levels. And, and you know, from my perspective, the, the, less, the, the less standards, the less governance we have, the, the better off we're going to be. There are existing standards that are out there. You know, industry has them. NATO has them. Follow them. And I'm going to use a NATO example for how this is really hurting us right now. You know, NATO adopts uh, standards that all 29 countries agree to them and 28 countries follow them and the one country that doesn't follow the nato standard for you know systems for fire systems for all the different types of systems is the united states and so but, but there's a standard that's there and then we we decide not to follow it we're we're one of the 29 and then we wonder why we can't while we're not interoperable with our, our allies. And so we do need to kind of, every once in a while, we got to pull it up and look at it from, from that particular perspective. And that's all I have, sir. Okay. Cameron? Sir, thank you again. Uh, <clears throat> I think two, two parting thoughts. Uh, software define everything because that is how you're going to create agility and resiliency. And we are really going to have to challenge ourselves as uh, not only warfighters but as industry on how we actually collect and deal with data because I think what we're going to see rather rapidly in the next uh, 18 to 24 months is the data explosion at the edge is going to far out any way for us to ingest it, analyze it, etc. Mm -hmm. Metadata, ontology, and analytics at the edge is going to be the future of how we do war fighting. Okay. General Brown? I feel the need, the need for speed. So um, as we start uh, really closing in on developing true information warfare capabilities that include cyber, EW, information operations, uh, and the requirement to therefore ingest, like Ron was talking about, all sorts of data that we're not, we're not looking at. Uh, I just want to reiterate the, the two or three things from my perspective, which is culture change and keeping the pair, uh, the willingness after it, take some risk and, and move along, and the development of true partnerships with industry, which I think this, this forum is a perfect example of that. And, and the, arm, the, the government is looking for ways, some innovative ways, to be able to get closer to industry, share classified information, and I just encourage everybody to keep on that path. Carl? So as we get closer to industry, uh, the one ask I would have of all of us is, Let's first enable a dialogue. We need your ideas. We need your expertise. I need, I need those opportunities to have honest conversations where none of us are going to go to jail at the end of it. And we can examine our problems from our perspectives and share that with you and gain some insights on how possibly you can help. Uh, so that, that honest dialogue has to be the beginning. But when Skynet comes online, this will all be fine, and it, it'll work great. You know, until then, we are going to have to thrive in chaos, and I think that's a, a, that's an asymmetric advantage for us. Thriving in chaos is what we can do today and get better at it. We're pretty good at it as U.S. Army. We tend to not even follow our own rules to do so. But um, it's not a technology or a human endeavor. It, it is a yes and. It is technology and humans. Let's always keep the human focused. The person that's going to make the most use of what we do correctly probably isn't a techie at heart. We've got to keep that absolutely in the forefront of what we do, make it easy so that their understanding changes. They never have to be a techie. They should never have to be a techie. That's what we provide the force. But we need to help them understand their environment, them make uh, risk-informed decisions on the battlefield. Thank you. Final closing 
again, the takeaway is we absolutely must treat data as a strategic asset. It cannot be tightly coupled or variated systems. It really needs to be abstract out. And just the power of, of enriched data is just truly amazing. What you're seeing in your everyday personal life, what, what commercial industry is doing with data is just truly amazing. And final, again, really want to thank FCA and industry for your engagement and support in this dialogue and discussion as we move forward, helping us solve our problems uh, to then, you know, better protect and defend uh, what we are precious to. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. If you, everybody thank you. sit tight for just one second. I just want to make a couple comments. An hour and a half. Why was it an hour and a half? Because you heard the topic. You can't, you can't do justice in an hour and a half, but it's better than Why did we do it on the exhibit floor? All the experts that are supposed to be here today, this week, are on this floor. So that's, what, that's another reason it's here. But let me just go to the panel for just a second. Colonel Young, General Pugh, Cameron, Jerry, Mr. Pontius. I, I can't think of five more qualified people to be here to discuss a topic that is hard to discuss. Uh, and I think they did a fantastic job. And I want to thank you for doing that for us today. We're so here today because we heard you. We heard you the last two years talk about where do we need to go uh, more than we have in the past. This is a step forward. And from now on th throughout the day, we've got G General Vi coming uh, a, a little bit later. And we have uh, the PEOs this afternoon. We have uh, other transaction authority session uh, that will be done late this afternoon. Uh, and it's just going to go on and on. So we hope to help you get to where you want to go, and we really appreciate you being here this week, and another round of applause for a great panel. Thank you very much. For, uh, for credit for this session, just come over to my, uh, uh, your right, my left. Uh, there's, you can scan your badge and you're on your way. Thank you.